This is a film about a challenging trip to reach the South Pole in Antarctica and thence to return home. The first step towards the South Pole took six days to get from home to finally landing on the natural blue ice runway on the Union Glacier in Antarctica, and then another seven days of delay at the Union Glacier before flying to the South Pole. Unlike the North Pole, which is in the middle of the Arctic Ocean, the South Pole is in the middle of the Antarctic continent and so cannot be reached by icebreaker. With the COVID-19 pandemic in full swing, getting to Antarctica wasn't easy and involved passing 10 SARS-CoV-2 PCR and rapid antigen tests and wearing masks indoors in Antarctica except while eating. Our Boeing 757 was parked beside an Aleutian IL-76 heavy lift transport which carries cargo to the Union Glacier for AEL. Due to the size of the AEL camp, the 757 only carried 60 passengers. Once aboard, we had another COVID rapid test. As we were taxiing out for takeoff at Punta Arenas, we were lucky to see a Chilean Air Force Northrop F-5E taking off. This fighter aircraft entered Chilean service in 1976. The flying time from Punta Arenas to the Union Glacier is 4 hours and covers 1,860 miles or 3,000 kilometers. It was a comfortable flight to Antarctica in the chartered Icelandic Air Boeing 757 which has replaced the Aleutian IL-76 for passenger transport. The jet only carries 60 passengers on this flight but it also carries cargo for AEL. We were lucky to have clear skies so we could see the snow-covered mountains of the Antarctic Peninsula and the peak of Mount Vincent, the highest peak in Antarctica, at 4,892 meters or 16,050 feet. The remote AEL camp is located in the spectacular southern Ellsworth Mountains on the broad expanse of the Union Glacier. The Blue Ice Runway has a scalloped surface, which makes its surface rougher than an asphalt runway. The weather was ideal with a 20 knot wind blowing down the runway when the Boeing 757 approached. Mother Nature largely maintains the runway with the exception of some minor snow clearance. The Blue Ice Runway was certified by the Chilean Directorate of General Civilian Aviation in 2008 for VFR use. It has a maximum length of 3,100 meters or 10,000 feet and a width of about 50 meters or 164 feet. The runway's profile has a pronounced vertical curve that means an observer can't see the total length of the runway when standing at either end. The first ever landing of a commercial Boeing 757 passenger airliner on a blue ice runway in Antarctica occurred in 2015 at Union Glacier. We drove the 8 kilometers to the AEL camp in a slow moving track Tucker Snowcat. After a weather delay of 7 days we would finally fly to the South Pole with one of the most experienced Antarctic pilots who has over a decade of experience flying around the continent. We would make the 600 nautical mile or 1200 kilometer flight from the Union Glacier to the South Pole in a Basler BT-67 which can make the return flight without refueling whilst the Twin Otter would have to refuel at a fuel dump in the Teal Mountains. Finally, we were able to board the 78-year-old World War II aircraft bound for the South Pole. The Basler BT-67 aircraft serving AEL is operated by Ken Boric Air from Calgary, Alberta. It is an upgraded Douglas DC-3 that was manufactured in 1944 in World War II in Santa Monica, California. The actual rotational speed of the propellers cannot be gauged when watching videos of a propeller-driven aircraft, 
since the camera's shutter speed appears to either freeze or slow down the motion of the propeller blades. Hence, when the aircraft is in flight, a slowly moving propeller blade looks very wrong, as does the bent shape of the propeller blades due to the camera's significant rolling shutter. When moving, friction causes the skis to heat up, so when stopped, the skis melt the snow, which then freezes the skis to the surface. To free the stuck skis, the pilot rev the engine and wag the rudder in the prop wash, which causes the plane to move from side to side. The conditions at the Union Glacier were marginal for flight, but our experienced pilot knew that once away from the glacier, the conditions for the flight to the South Pole were excellent. Over six months, the Basler Turbo Conversions Company takes a DC-3 or C-47 and replaces old instruments, modifies the airframe by inserting a 40-inch plug in the fuselage forward of the wing, which increases the DC-3's volume by 35%, extends the wing tips, and most importantly replaces the original radial engines with new Pratt & Whitney Canada PT-6A 67R turboprop engines. These engines require less maintenance because the overhaul time is at 6,000 hours versus 1,200 for the radial engines. Five-bladed metal propellers are used instead of the three-bladed props that pulled the original aircraft along. In 1911, Roll Amundsen started his successful dog sled journey to become the first human to reach the South Pole on 14 December 1911. All five members of this party returned. Five weeks later, Robert Scott, starting from Ross Island, also reached the South Pole, but this time by man-hauling sleds. Tragically, all five members of his party died on the return journey. At cruising altitude, the polar plateau was largely featureless except for a number of huge crevasses, parts of which were covered in snow which made them look man-made. Of course, for those skiing to the South Pole, the plateau is not featureless, especially given the Sastrugi littering the plateau. We flew past the AEL fuel cache at the Teal Mountains, which is used to allow AEL's aircraft to reach distant destinations such as the Axel Heiberg Glacier for those skiers following Amundsen's route to the South Pole. As we neared the South Pole, we could see the tracks made by the Arctic trucks that drove to the South Pole from Union Glacier. After Amundsen and Scott tented at the South Pole in 1911-1912, there was no structure built there until 1956 when as part of the International Geophysical Year, the United States built a station at the South Pole and has occupied it continuously since then. The main building, which has been replaced twice since then, stands at an elevation of 2,835 meters or 9,306 feet on ice which is about 2,700 meters or 9,000 feet thick. The ice sheet moves away from the South Pole at about 10 meters or 33 feet per year. The dark sector is an area near the station which has kept clear sources of interference with electromagnetic signals that could hamper radio telescopes. The area has several observatories. Parked at the station was a Ken Borg Twin Otter serving the National Science Foundation's activities. 
Happily, we do play near the excellent toilet facilities provided by the NFS. However, the temperature of negative 29 degrees Celsius or negative 20 degrees Fahrenheit combined with a wind speed of 12 knots made for a very cold visit to the South Pole with frostbite being of concern. Since the South Pole is covered by a moving sheet of ice, any marker placed on the actual geographic South Pole would move north by about 10 meters or 33 feet a year. Hence, there is a ceremonial South Pole placed permanently in front of the U.S. South Pole Station for photographic opportunities and a temporary marker placed at the Geographic South Pole, or 90 degrees south, on the 1st of January each year. For some, the remoteness of the South Pole and the difficulty of getting to it means that it holds many secrets, such as a secret Nazi base established at the end of World War II, and a hole at the South Pole that serves as an entrance to the hollow earth where UFOs fly in and out of their secret base. Unfortunately, I didn't see any of these secrets despite holding the required security clearance. However, I did walk around the geographic South Pole in my unsuccessful search for the entrance to the hollow earth where I hope to escape the bitterly cold wind and warm up. Each year on 1 January, a beautiful new marker is placed at the Geographic South Pole, or 90 degrees south, by the staff of the U.S. South Pole Station. Unfortunately, due to the cost of removal, there is a large area at the South Pole Station that serves as a junkyard and includes leftovers from defunct experimental setups and worn-out machinery. The latest version of the main South Pole Station building was opened in 2008 and can be raised up to counter the principal forces that affect it. AEL has a camp at the South Pole which serves clients who wish to stay overnight there and skiers and truckers who end their journey at the South Pole before being flown back by Ken Boric Air to the Union Glacier. There were a couple of Arctic trucks at the AEL camp that had made the trip from Union Glacier to the South Pole. Later, back in Punta Arenas, I met and talked with the CEO of Arctic Trucks, an Icelandic company, at a PCR testing site before we flew homewards. From the AEL camp, we made the cold trip by snowmobile back to the plane for our return flight to the Union Glacier. Unfortunately, due to COVID-19, we couldn't visit the South Pole Station and in fact we were told to keep a physical distance from it. If the station was occupied, we wouldn't have known it as we never saw anyone. As we boarded the plane, I couldn't help but think of what Robert Falcon Scott said of the place when he reached the South Pole and realized that Amundsen had beaten him there. He wrote in his diary, Great God, this is an awful place. Soon we were off on the four-hour flight back to the Union Glacier. As the pilot has surmised, the weather on the polar plateau was good, but we knew that that wasn't the case at Union Glacier. Nearing the Union Glacier, we descended through the cloud deck to poor weather on the glacier. On engine shutdown, the aircraft on the flight line were tied down as the weather forecast was for terrible weather with high winds and snow.
When the predicted blizzard arrived, the winds gusted over 76 knots or 88 miles per hour, which are the wind speeds associated with a Category 1 hurricane. Needless to say, our 757 flight to Puerto Arenas was cancelled, which killed my scheduled return flights home, and I was forced to rebook my flights using an expensive satellite phone connection. The noise of the hurricane force winds in my tent were very loud, which made sleeping a challenge. The blizzard caused snow buildup around the camp, so the snow accumulation had to be cleared from the tents in the campsite. The source of the water for use around the camp, including showering and cooking, was melted snow water. The high winds appeared to subside, so the twin otters of the Chilean Air Force at Union Glacier attempted to take off, but the wind gusts were still too strong, so they returned to their camp to await the winds to die down. The next day the winds died down and Bork restarted its flight operations in support of ALE. After Bork restarted flight operation, the Twin Otters of the Chilean Air Force took off and overflew their camp before starting their long journey back to Punta Arenas. We were supposed to fly out on the 15th, but the Chilean Air Force decided to land a couple of Herks that evening, so our 757 flight was postponed for yet another day, which again killed my return flights home, and I was forced to make yet another expensive satellite phone call to rebook. The Chilean runway. That we actually, yeah, we did, we do, we did build it. We did actually do service it. Um, but yeah, they actually like they use that. Um, so we have, no, we have an agreement with them. That night, I went out to the Blue Ice Runway to watch the two Chilean C-130 Herculeses land to load up the personnel and equipment from their camp on the Union Glacier for the flight back to Punta Arenas. The C-130Hs which we saw landing we had earlier seen at the airbase at Punta Arenas. They are long service planes that were delivered to the Chilean Air Force in 1972. The ice surface of the blue ice runway is strong enough such that aircraft can land using wheels instead of skis, and wheeled aircraft can carry much heavier loads than ski equipped aircraft. Since the blue ice runway is on a glacier, it moves along every year by about 30 meters. Because of the ice's low coefficient of friction, planes tend to decelerate using reverse thrust as opposed to traditional means of breaking the wheels, and so the runway needs to be much longer than a traditional runway.
The two C-130s lined up at the start of the runway where the Chilean Armed Forces personnel and equipment would be loaded up. After three and a half hours, the Herks took off for the flight back to Punta Arenas. Finally, after a delay of four days, the conditions were right for the flight of the 757 from Punta Arenas to the Union Glacier and we were headed out to the runway. During our drive to the runway, we glanced back towards the AEL camp and could see a pair of skydivers who had jumped from a twin otter, slowly descending to a landing at the camp. It was a relief to watch our 757 touch down on the blue ice runway as it marked our first step on our long journey home from Antarctica. The runway is naturally crevasse free and strong winds flowing down from the surrounding mountains keep the runway generally free from snow. As it is a non-instrumented runway, big jets require weather that allows them to see the runway from about 20 to 30 kilometers or 12 to 18 miles out when at an altitude of 2100 meters or 7000 feet. With the 757 stopped in position at the end of the runway for cargo handling and takeoff, the new arrivals disembarked and the ground crew quickly unloaded the cargo and loaded the plane with our luggage and refuse, such as huge containers of urine for removal to Punta Arenas. Finally, it was our time to board the plane for our return flight back to a world afflicted with the Omicron virus. Several more PCR tests would await us on our journey back home, but at least the long journey had started. In conclusion, we were lucky to be able to get to the South Pole despite all the delays since it could have taken even longer given the four day long blizzard that rolled in upon our return to the Union Glacier. Take me somewhere nice To some tired island in your heart called paradise